Welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this is a special ACDA Advocacy and Collaboration Committee curated episode. Whoo, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Today, you're going to hear from Chorus America's VP of Communication and Membership, Liza Beth. Liza is fantastic. Even though she didn't sing in a choir growing up, she knows her stuff and she knows the power of communicating your story, both the glamorous ones and the quiet ones. In this conversation, we talk about how Liza got into Chorus America and she talks about the unique choral community that we all get to be a part of and what a powerful tool that is. She talks about a lot of different ways that we can utilize the resources of Chorus America, but specifically she's going to give you a to-do list of how you too can become a marketing storytelling guru. You're going to have to listen all the way to the end and make sure you check out the quote cards that I made for this one because she dropped some fantastic quotes. If you want to join the conversation and get help with any of your marketing or storytelling, jump over to patreon.com slash music ed matters. We meet up every month and we have conversations like what stories are you telling and how are you hashtagging? Which by the way, Liza is going to tell you today why hashtags are important from a marketing perspective. You can also jump over to emilybirch.org slash contact and get in touch with me or slash sponsors and see our awesome sponsors that make these episodes possible. Both Kaleidoscope Adventures and the Kinnison Coral Company, we can't thank you enough. But really, I can't thank you enough for listening. So without further ado, a collaboration episode with Chorus America and my new friend, Liza Beth. Today... On the Music and Matters podcast, we are welcoming Chorus America's VP of Communication and Membership, Liza Beth. Hello, Liza. Hi, it's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. I've been so excited to talk to you. You were one of the few that came on for a pre-podcast conversation, and I was so excited I wanted to record that because we had such an easy <laughs> conversation. <laughs> I'm really excited. This is one of our curated advocacy and collaboration episodes. So that means you were recommended by someone on the ACDA National Committee for Advocacy and Collaboration. And we're going to talk about tips for that. In fact, we're talking about using values-based messaging for advocacy. But before we dive into all that, tell the listener, who's Liza Beth? Sure. Um, so um, at Chorus America, what, you know, vice president of communications and membership, what that actually means is I'm the person who edits Chorus America's voice magazine and the articles on our website. Um, I work with our communications team on marketing our conference and marketing our other programs. Um, I work with our membership team on developing services and um, getting our membership messaging out there. And um, I also do a lot of work on our research, which I think is something you and I will probably touch on today. Um, I have been at Chorus America for about 10 years now. Um, I, like, of course I grew up singing because everyone, I totally believe that everyone is a singer. And so I sang with my family and I sang in school and I sang, you know, now I sing with my kids. But I am actually uh, a little bit of an outlier on the Chorus America staff in that I'm not, you know, I don't have formal choral training. You, I have not, I have not sung a lot in organized choral groups. Um, and so working at Chorus America, for me, one of the great gifts of that has been that it's also been in some ways my introduction to the choral community. And so I just feel so privileged to be a part of that community through my work with Chorus America. It's choral singing, it's a uniquely participatory art form. Um, and it is also just a wonderful community of really giving, really collaborative, really generous people. And so I just feel really lucky to, to get to be a part of it with what I do. I love that quote. It's a uniquely participatory activity. So you're yeah. getting a firsthand dive into what it means to be part of a choral community. Yep, absolutely. Back to that, for sure. Yeah. 
You do a lot. You were giving us the job description of everything you cover. There seems to be a little bit of editing and Englishing, marketing yeah. and communication. How did you get into all of that? What was your pre-Course America time like? So I did get into it kind of through through what you were just touching on, which is the writing and the loving, you know, loving putting words together. Um, I started my first job out of college was actually at a cookbook publisher where I ended up working in publicity. So I would write press releases and do author tours and set up like cooking segments on local TV shows and sometimes on the Today Show, which was so fun. And I still love food. Um, and then transitioned into using those skills at arts organizations. So uh, my most recent job before Chorus America, I was the director of marketing for Children's Theater of Charlotte, which is a professional theater for young audiences in Charlotte, North Carolina. So, so cool. So you, you have a love for food, but love marketing. Food, food. Love the arts. Yeah. think they go together so well. Love museums. Like, if there was a cooking coral museum event, that would be like, <laughs> that would be my happy spot. That would That's be my a happy perfect place. collaboration. We'll have to start seeing oh. if we can get something like that happening. I'm starting, I love to cook as well. It's my little hobby on the side. I joke with my yeah. husband. When I retire, I'm going to start Emmy's Diner, the food truck that travels wherever I want to go, but it's a vegan diner, but oh, you're not going to know it. it. And we'll have Love singing it. and there'll be wine tasting. Obviously, I have way too much. Well, when you start that, let's talk about, you know, showing up at a Chorus America conference yeah. and oh. all of that. I think there, I know, I know some other, I know some other choral friends who love to cook. I feel like we could really get a whole thing going. I feel so. like there's something there. Look, that's a great little segue into collaboration. So you bring to the table such a unique history. Tell us a little bit about what you've done as you've grown into your role as VP, because I don't think you started as VP of marketing and communication 10 years ago. No, I didn't. I actually started as director of communication. So the sort of the membership aspect is kind of what I've I've added during my time at Chorus America. And I think um, as I've grown into that role, I think the areas that that's really grown is leading, um, like really contributing to projects like the Chorus Impact Study, our big research projects. And also um, just getting to be more part of our, those conversations about uh, the needs that we're seeing in our membership, how can Chorus America meet those needs and how can we, you know, how can we be out there letting people know about the resources we have? Because we actually have a lot to offer, whether you're a member of Chorus America or not, you know, we very much see ourselves as a resource for the broad field um, beyond our membership as well and, and want to want to be helpful in that way too. So. so you started by communication. You added the human element, the membership part. In the podcast, we've already talked to the executive director, Catherine De yeah. Dehoney, about all the things that Course America is. But can you give the listener a quick primer? Who is Course America? What is Course America? What do you all do? Yeah, sure. So, um, so we are, I think of Course America as the advocacy, research, and leadership development organization that serves the choral field. So we, um, we serve choral leaders of all, of all types. We really serve the whole organization. So if you're an artistic leader, if you're an administrative leader, if you're a board member, um, if you are, you know, if you are on a board committee, um, we really, we, we want to be there offering you like the tools and the training and the access. Um, and I think perhaps most importantly of all the networking and the connections that you need to, to really be part of that choral community that you and I were talking about at the beginning of this conversation. Like, who are, who are the other people that you can connect with to learn the things that you need to make your organization as strong as it can be? Um, we are also a membership organization. We have about 7,000 members and we serve both organizations and individuals. So we have organizational members and individual members and you can belong in either way, depending on, depending on what, what your needs are. Um, and I think we were, you and I touched on this a little bit, but we, our members are primarily involved with independent choruses, nonprofit choruses, community choruses, um, children and youth choruses, but we do have a lot of resources to offer um, for people who are involved in schools, in colleges, and universities as well, so. 
That's why I'm so excited about this conversation because as someone who trains future educators that are most likely yeah. going out into the school system, but then also someone that has independent choral organizations, I get to see the inside membership part of it, but I also get yeah. to hear the questions from people in the schools of why would I be part of Course America? And I think this is a great opportunity to answer that question. Well, and it's all incredibly related because, of course, um, without the amazing work that is done in the schools and is done in our colleges and universities, that is all part of the coral pipeline. And that is what is contributing to a healthy, thriving coral ecosystem today. I um, love so that. That's, so so it, we all, you know, we all need each other and we all work together so closely. And that's really important. I love it. And you're at resources, so many of which are available, even if you're not a member of Course America, which I think is so important because membership is a little bit more pricey because of who you're attracting. And I think that's really important because you get what you put in. And I really value my time at everything Course America. I value the conferences. I value the resources. I value the magazine that you send me. Those are really great resources and they're different than the resources I get from ACDA. Yes. So I think that's really important to see how this all crosses over. And I think we're going to talk about some of these specifically today. So do you want to start by talking about the Chorus Impact Study and your role in all of that? Yeah, I can totally talk about that. Um, I think when I, you know, I Emmy, mean, you, you sort of, we, our, our main focus today is talking about values-based advocacy and how to use values-based language in your advocacy messaging. And when I think about that, what what I think that really means for me is connecting your advocacy to the why behind it and doing, you know, making sure that when you're, you're making your case and making your arguments that you're always connecting it to the why. And I think it's most effective to do this when your why is something that has a very positive and very broad impact. Um, When you have data and evidence that can support that why, And also when you're able to tell personal stories that really connect with people on that gut level and demonstrate that impact. So I feel like if you have those three ingredients, that is the perfect storm of advocacy. And that's kind of the, that's the the goal that we're all working towards. Um, And I think that when it comes to the impact study, which you asked about, for me, that, that gets at that sort of second piece the data and evidence that really can support the why. And it's important to have those kinds of things. Perfect. This episode is going to go so well into the course we're designing for how to get ready with advocacy and collaboration because this is a good starter. You have to connect to the why. So let's go back and unpack that for a second. For someone listening, what do you mean by creating a positive and broad impact that connects to the why? Explain how they can go about finding that type of approach. Right. So, you know, what does that mean for choral music? Right. I think um, when you when we when with choral music, I think there are just so many levels of why Um, I think one is what I might call the artistic why. So that might be, you know, we create beautiful music that moves us. It moves our singers. It moves our audiences. And that is a very real thing. I think we have all felt the realness of that. Um, And it's very important. But I think also when we kind of zoom out from that to take a broader view, we can see the ripple effects of choral music in an even bigger way. And at Chorus America, what we kind of talk about that is like the big why of choral music is its power to create community and to connect people. And so that is what that is sort of what we are very much trying to tap into with our messaging and also I think a very powerful a very powerful argument for the work that we all do in the field. Um, So that's really, that's really kind of what, that's really kind of what I mean about connecting to the why. And I think what's wonderful about that kind of, that those kinds of reasons and that kind of case making is that even if you are not somebody who sings in a chorus, and even if you have never been to a choral performance, you can still appreciate and get behind the way that choral music benefits singers and benefits communities, because really it, it's good for all of us. Mm. So yeah, That's perfect. So you're thinking people need to pause and create some type of statement of we do XYZ in our choral settings to 
build this type of community, to bring people together, to offer this type of, that makes so much sense. Yes, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I think, I think there's can be sort of two prongs of that. One is sort of, and this is where, this is where we kind of get to the second step of data and evidence, right? Mm -hmm. One is sort of the big picture data and evidence, and that's things like the chorus impact study, which shows how much singers give back to their communities. They're more likely to vote. They're more likely to volunteer. They're more likely to give philanthropically to their communities. Um, singers actually also show higher levels of tolerance and respect for diversity, um, which is also a really important, you know, something that's increasingly important, I think, in today's world is finding venues that encourage that and finding, finding ways to encourage that. Um, so, you know, there's sort of this, this big picture, this big picture aspect. And then I think, it's also so important, important to be talking about the ways that your course and your organization is specifically doing that. So, you know, are you, are you reaching out to a particular aspect of your community that you've, that you've decided it's important for your organization to be responding to and that you're growing a relationship with? Are you doing uh, programming that perhaps highlights an issue and working with local organizations that are supporting that programming on some interest, something that's interesting and collaborative. By all means, um, those are things that you should be talking about with, with the people that, the people that you're, you're hoping to bring on as supporters. I like that the things that you're saying are things we innately know as educators, as choral directors, as singers, as choir members, we know that these opportunities for conversation and community and how they impact us as a whole is there, but you are providing the data. Where does this data come from, from the Coral Impact Study, Chorus Impact Study? It comes from, it comes from surveying singers primarily. So um, for, you know, thousands and thousands of singers. So our most recent one was done in 2019. Um, and we launched a very broad survey that was that we shared and ACDA actually collaborated with us on it and supported the project and helped us share um, to a really, a really broad audience of singers who responded to questions like this and, and made it possible for us to, you know, be able to come back with data points. Um, like one, one, for example, that I, that I made a note of here because I love this one so much is that 63% of singers credit singing with helping with making them more accepting of people who are different from them. Mm, so, 63%. That's huge. Yeah. That's so, yeah. statistically significant. It is statistically significant. So, um, and, and the, the chorus impact study, you know, we partnered, we partnered with a research firm to make sure that all of the things that we are saying in it are statistically significant. So. Awesome. And so if someone wants some of these data points to support connecting to their why and telling their story with data, where do they find all of this data? It's all on our website, um, chorusamerica.org. And the course, and you, you can absolutely come to our website. I think rather than give you a long URL, I would just come to our website and search for the Chorus Impact Study. The most recent one is called the Chorus Impact Study Singing for a Lifetime. Um, and it also looks at, it took a, a special look at the benefits of singing for older adults and creative aging and things like that as well. So there's a lot of really great data in there too. The, we, we've done this study three times. Um, just about every decade for about the for for a while now, um, and the study, the the one that we did previously to the most recent one, did take a special look at at the benefits of singing for students and young singers, um, mm -hmm. and they it talked to educators to get their thoughts on that, and parents to get their thoughts on that, um, and also surveyed singers themselves. I will make sure to link the most recent one in the episode notes, but that's great to know that we can go back and look at the past results too, because it'll be different. You talk about connecting to your why and whoever mm -hmm. you're telling your choral story to, you need to know what they're approaching you with as well yes, so that you absolutely. know how to cater that data. 
I think that's a good way to segue into your rediscover harmony because you're having to cater yeah. that new message. This is a beautiful campaign. And when we had Catherine on, she talked about it releasing soon, but it hadn't come out. So I'd love to hear a little review of what is this campaign? How has it been going and how can we utilize it? Yeah, I'm so excited to talk about Rediscover Harmony. Um, So this is a campaign, this is a social media campaign for and about choruses, and we launched it in November. Um, And anyone who's listening should definitely go to the rediscoverharmony.com website to check it out. Um, It is, it's, the focus is raising public awareness about the amazing value that choruses bring to their communities. And really the message of the campaign is, is, sort of, you know, through the pandemic and really before the pandemic, we we have all been challenged to feel more connected to each other and to find ways to pursue that connection and to come back together and to find that, to find those points of common ground and connection. And choral singing, whether you sing in, you know, a choir, a singing community, a school choir, choral singing is an amazing way to do that. And it's something that we can all really get behind. And so the campaign is all about raising awareness for that. Uh, So there's, if you, on the website, uh, there's a directory of choral organizations that you can search to see what's going on in your area, look for organizations to support, look for kinds of choral activity. There's a really fun tool called the Harmonizer where you can create your own chords with the voices of 37 real choral singers from across the US and Canada. And and you can see these beautiful, joyful videos of them singing the notes that that they were assigned for the harmonizer. And and there's also a lot of, of tools for sharing this via social media. We just released a video. Uh, for the campaign. So just a lot of really great content to share and that we hope choral leaders and organizations can share to support whatever way that they are rediscovering harmony. Oh, I love this. Okay. I have some very specific questions since you're a marketing communications guru. Yep. Our choir has an intern and they manage all of the social media. We call it audience management and marketing. Yeah. And so they design all of our social media stuff. And it's easy for attracting the young population because they know how to do stories and Snapchat and TikTok, TikTok yeah, and all I that know. jazz. But how would you suggest someone listening who's doing all of it by themselves that doesn't have someone doing it for them? What are some ways that they could infuse the tools and the pieces of Rediscover Harmony into their website, social media presence, et cetera, to raise more awareness and views ultimately? Absolutely. I mean, I think one one really easy thing to do would be to go to the website and find the video and share that on your social platforms. Um, because I think that you know, video is just video is is content that is really attractive on social media. It's a beautiful, it's it's a it's a it's very emotional. It's a beautiful way to get people feeling involved in what you're talking about. And I think it would also be most powerful if you post it with a message that relates to your organization as well. So perhaps you're rediscovering harmony by putting together, um, you know, your first concert in a few months. You can mention that in your social media post and definitely use the hashtag rediscover harmony, hashtag rediscover harmony. And, you know, but but also, you know, rediscovering harmony might look like a new community engagement program, mm-hmm. or it might look like um, a piece that you're doing with your students that you're particularly excited about. And that's what rediscovering harmony looks like for you right now. So I think just sort of finding the content, but then connecting it specifically to your story is what's really going to make it authentic and specific to your to your why and to the why of the work that you do. That's a really great tie back to those three steps you gave us earlier too. One is connecting it all back to your why, two is having the data, and three is telling the story. So yes. you've given us at Rediscover Harmony, Rediscu- yeah, Rediscover Harmony, you've given us something to start with. So find the video, create a little message that's telling your individual story, whether it's a concert, a piece, a program, something that's helping you rediscover harmony. Um, Can you tell us why are hashtags important? 
Well, hashtags are important because that's how people can search for things and find them on social media. So when you post something with the hashtag rediscoverharmony.com, you kind of become part of the whole community of people that are posting about that. And that just means that other people who are participating in the cam campaign are more likely to see what you're posting, more likely to repost it, um, including Chorus America, because we are always watching to see you know, how people are participating, how this is being useful to people and organizations and looking for ways to amplify it. So oh, that's awesome. Okay. So step one, video and share the message. All right. Then what do we do? We've done that. We wait a couple of days. What's step two? I would say go to the harmonizer and okay. play with it and create your own little chord composition. And then that's something you can also share on social media. I think the most like no matter what, the most important thing to think about is story and share. So come up with a story that resonates for you and then share, share, share. Oh, I love this. And not be afraid of sharing because I think so often we kind of get caught in the comparison game. And that's mm -hmm. something that musicians talk about all the time. And I think what you're saying is the comparison game doesn't matter. If you're telling your story and you're telling it authentically in a way that will touch back to your why and touch yeah. your audience, that's all that matters. Well, and I think there are also ways to do that, um, that lean on kind of collaboration and, you know, perhaps there's an organization out there that is inspiring you um, and you want to share something that they posted and sort of show how that has had an impact on your own work. That is a wonderful thing to do as well. I think that's an important part of social media too. Sharing doesn't always have to mean just sharing about you and just sharing about your work. It, it really means, you know, sharing that very rich web of connection. And just like we're doing today because we're yeah. collaborating. I mean, I think that's the coolest yeah, part. Yeah, absolutely. I totally I'm, agree. I'm hoping that after this episode airs, there'll be a huge influx of hashtag rediscover harmony happening with all the listeners. I will definitely, we'll, we'll stay in touch about that and I will report back on our Google Analytics. Oh, cool. I love Google Analytics. I should add the hashtag of hashtag music and matters podcast. Although that's yes, a lot definitely. of words. That's a of lot course. of words. <laughs> Well, but you know, there can never be too many hashtags. There can never be so. too many. Oh, this is so helpful. Okay. You've given us the step-by-step -step guidance mm -hmm. of really making value-based advocacy conversations. You've given us resources. You've given us the step-by-step -step to kick off our next campaign of storytelling. What else do you want to talk about today? I mean, so I did with the stories, one thing that I did want to share is I think often, um, Often when you're sharing stories, I think people tend to maybe think of a certain kind of glamorous story that they need to be sharing. Like if you have a student in your program who has gone on to be a professional singer, which is wonderful and is absolutely something to share. But I would also encourage people to dig a little deeper and talk about some of the less obvious and quieter stories because those can be equally as important. So like one thing I was kind of thinking about is, you know, maybe you have a student who's been who's been struggling in school, uh, but connects with choir in a way that they don't connect with other subjects. And because of that, it's become a community and a place of belonging for them and, um, you know, allowed them to be happy in school in a way that they might not have been otherwise. I think those are stories that are equally important to share. And so in our Rediscover Harmony, in our Rediscover Harmony stories, we've tried not to just, we've tried to really um, showcase the full nuance of what the choral community is experiencing right now. For some groups, that looks like being able to come back to the performance stage. For other groups, that looks like maybe this winter they had to make a hard decision to postpone a concert because it wasn't a safe time for their community to come together. All of there is room for all of that. All of that is to be celebrated. And I think that's a really important thing for us all to remember when we're thinking about storytelling as well. I love as we're having this conversation, I'm taking notes of the awesome things you're saying, but you're also giving me tons of ideas. Oh, good. I think this is so <laughs> cool. And I hope the listener is getting the same, oh, that's a good idea from what I can share. Oh, that's a good part of the story I could tell. Like we're doing this piece about Amelia Earhart and Louisa May Alcott Whoa. and Ella Fitzgerald. It was written for my choir by a dear friend from grad school, Christina Collins. She's amazing. Great composer. Uh -huh. 
but she wrote us this piece about really dynamite women and their yeah. their lyrics, their their very famous quotes, and the girls have loved it because they're all different styles. And so I got the coolest text from a parent last night with a link to some cool article about Louisa May Alcott. And she said, I don't know where this came from. I'm guessing you, but thanks for teaching our kids about awesome women. Yes. I didn't, like, that would be a cool article to share. I didn't even think about the fact that's a quiet story. Yeah, I love that so much. And I think that um, we are all learning so much from choral Mm -hmm. music and from the music that we sing. It's not, you know, there's music, there's words, there's concepts. It's connected to history and stories. And there are so many quiet stories present in all of that. I love it. I'm going to steal that, tell the quiet story. You know, you sure know an awful lot about choir and the heartbeat of all of this. You do your homework. <laughs> well, it's like, I feel like I have, I, I do do my homework, but I also feel like part of that goes back to kind of what I was saying about what a generous community this is and how I feel like everyone that I've encountered has been so generous with what they know. And my colleagues are too, you know, I'm always messaging them and saying, I don't really understand about this musical thing. Can you advise me here? And we, you know, we, we bring all of those perspectives together and it's a great thing. I have to give Course America credit for my podcast. So back before the pandemic, I know, I don't think I've told you this before the pandemic. One of the things I was doing when I was just a committee member on the ANC committee Mm -hmm. was we researched all of the podcasts that are available in the music, specifically choral world. And you guys had a website that had a list, but it was a little outdated at that time. So not only did I take that list, I contacted every host. I went searching for every single podcast that was out there and created a living document so we could see what are the podcasts, what are the places you can listen, who's the host, what are they doing, how often do they publish, and those hosts have access to update and edit as needed. But we've also been adding all these new ones that have come across after the pandemic. that's so great. But you'll, that's how I, I got I think, mine started. I think maybe I've seen this, but you'll have to share it with me again. I would love to see that. And I also love, you know, sort of what you're saying. That's actually really like you took that resource and you kind of used it to create your own community of practice and learning. And that is really, I think, what it's all about. So I love well, that thanks. so much too. It was cool to see what's being given by podcasts right now. And that was how I found my little niche of what was needed. My yeah. students don't get to meet every human that I get to meet, but I want them to. And so this became an opportunity for my students to meet people, but also to continue learning because we should never stop. So anyway, I just, I don't think I had told you that. And it was very impactful using one of your- I'm glad to hear that. I love, (laughs) I, I love hearing how these, you know, how the little pieces that people take and run with and turn into something new and wonderful. So isn't that kind of what we're doing though? Like the perfect little- connective tissue for this whole conversation. You never know what tiny little quiet story thing you'll share, thing you'll do will impact someone in your choir, in your audience, in your community. What a motivating little conversation. This is perfect. Thanks, Liza. Is there anything else? I always let the guest have one final thing of like the one thing that really matters before we stop recording. I would just say, and, and, and this isn't a new thing that I haven't said before, but to come back to what I, if there's one thing I hope someone, you know, sort of finishes listening to this thinking, it's that I think in the choral field, we have, we have an incredible advantage because we truly have an amazing why story at our fingertips. I think we all feel that every day that we work in this field and we see the evidence of that. And so I would just encourage us all to really lean into that when we are creating our messaging and thinking about the people that we want to reach and we want to convince and we want to just keep having this community grow and grow. So that is what I would love to leave your listeners with. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation and I loved uh, discovering some new points of connection. How cool is our choral ecosystem? I love that Liza encouraged us not just to tell the glamorous stories, but the quiet ones as well. She gave us a pretty good checklist, so you all have a little bit of homework. Here we go. Step one, 
go to rediscoverharmony.com and share the video there with a personal story of your message. How are you rediscovering harmony? And don't forget to hashtag rediscover harmony and hashtag music and matters podcast. That's a lot, but you can do it. Step two in a week or so, jump back over to rediscoverharmony.com and play with the harmonizer. Maybe even make it a competition among your singers or your classes. And then of course, share that with a personal story. You can always, if you're looking for content for your marketing campaigns, jump over to rediscoverharmony.com and share other people's stories. Remember when you share those stories, you're sharing how they impact and touch you. And ultimately, you're sharing to authentically touch back to your why. That's the whole point of today's conversation with Liza Beth. Using values-based storytelling to advocate for what we get to do. Y'all, I hope you feel inspired. I love these ANC episodes, and I really love that you listen. Thank you for making this show possible and for all that you do. Now, in case no one has told you today, don't rob me of my favorite part here. You, my friend, you matter. We all know that music matters, especially values-based advocacy storytelling and collaborating. And I'll see you next time on the Music and Matters podcast.